G'day team, Matt Crummins here, and welcome to the Learning Gallery, where we're here to dissect one of my favorite images. We're gonna talk about how I went about constructing the composition, the logic behind the settings I chose, and of course, we're gonna do a bare or walkthrough of the edit, from raw file to polished product. Now, let's jump right in as we jet over to Exmouth in Western Australia and sink beneath the surface of the East Indian Ocean and descend onto the Ningaloo Reef. So to start with, I have to say a massive, massive thank you to the Coral Bay Eco Tours and uh, Will Nolan as well, who took us out um, as paid guests, but they treated us spectacularly uh, to get us in the right spot at the right time with the right wildlife. I tell you what, we went out there, um, we were meant to be scuba diving. However, because we were there a little bit last minute, it was school holidays, there was no real availability anywhere to dive. And so we bit the bullet and said, hey, let's go for a snorkel, which in my opinion's always kind of been the poorer cousin of scuba diving. I've always gone, oh, I don't really want to snorkel. I really want to be under the surface with the, you know, with the ability to breathe properly, to be able to get my compositions right. But so be it, this is what we had. We wanted to go out and see the whale sharks. We wanted to see the Ningaloo Reef and, and this is what we could do at the time. And it actually turned out to be one of the best things for me. So we went out for the day. Um, this particular day was our whale shark day. So we do a couple of dives um, or a couple of snorkels, I should say, on the, um, the inner reef at Ningaloo. And then we head out um, a little bit later on in the afternoon to scout out the whale sharks, which was absolutely spectacular. But I've got to say that the Ningaloo um, snorkeling trip was actually probably one of my favorite parts. So um, I was diving there with my Nordicam housing and my Sony A1 using the 16 to 35 millimeter lens, um, which is my pretty standard setup. And this time I didn't have any strobes with me. Um, we were traveling around Western Australia for three months, did not have a lot of space in the car um, with all the other gadgetry that we had with us. And so um, I decided that the strobes were gonna stay at home. Um, I really, really enjoy natural light photography underwater, especially, um, and I've sort of, probably enjoying it more now with my Sony A1 than I ever have in the past. Just the, its ability to capture, um, you know, the, the range of color, even with natural light, even at depth, um, you can actually capture incredible color if you re-white balance it in Lightroom. And so um, I feel it gives you a lot more of a natural looking photo. Um, not to say that I don't use strobes, I certainly do, but I've really been enjoying some natural light photography uh, with my Sony A1 setup. So, this is the shot that we uh, that, that I took that I'm absolutely stoked with. I'll go full screen there for you. Um, now, for some people, you might go, oh, turtles, because you live in a tropical environment. For me, turtles are just amazing, and I never get to spend any time with them. Um, normally, it's a fleeting moment during a dive, or you know, they're there munching on coral or something where they're not overly photogenic. I don't. I haven't often seen them come up to the surface just with the diving locations and conditions that I've been in. So I was absolutely stoked to see that these turtles, um, you know, probably sort of about five or six of them, and they were all coming up towards the surface um, periodically, which just gave some amazing opportunities for photography. Probably the biggest consideration with this sort of wildlife um, and, and diving or being in the water with, with animals is that, like people, they don't like being chased. And you can see it a lot when you get out onto a snorkel boat and people who haven't seen them before just get their GoPros out and just like hell for leather swimming at these poor animals. Um, and they take off pretty quickly. Um, there's one thing I can guarantee, it's that ocean animals are better at swimming than you are. <laughs> so um, it's really important when you're looking for this sort of wildlife that you keep a bit of distance to work out what your game plan is gonna be, not just with your settings, but also your composition and how you're gonna go about framing them in the shot. So what really struck me um, on this particular day was it was a full sun day. There was no um, cloud in the sky at all. So we had these beautiful light rays coming through the water. Um, really clear conditions, but when you get really strong light hitting the surface, even in clear conditions, um, all that particle matter lights up and creates this beautiful, what we call volumetric lighting. And that's those sort of light streaks that you see. Um, unfortunately, these days, uh, a lot of the ones you see in photos have been painted in in Photoshop. Um, but uh, when you get underwater on these conditions, you get some pretty spectacular, um, some spectacular light patterns. I also particularly love that on this day, we had really calm conditions. So it wasn't dead still, but it was certainly still enough. And what it meant was that we had these beautiful rippled reflections on the surface. And as soon as I popped my mask under the water, I could see all this, you know, all the reef um, reflecting in the surface there. And of course, um, when I saw the turtles, I could see these sort of broken up turtle patterns. I just thought, this is gonna be awesome. 
So anyway, um, saw the turtle, it was swimming along. I gained a little bit of pace, not swimming towards it, but it's kind of swimming a wide berth around to the side of it, hoping to catch up to it on its side. Now, if you chase it from behind, these things are gonna freak out, but if you're swimming sort of next to it, they tend not to care too much. And so I had quite a good opportunity, as much as I could keep up with my housing and my tiny fins, <laughs> to, uh, to, to go alongside it for a little while. Now, before I approached to get the photo, there was a couple of things I had to think about. Firstly, I'm lugging a massive camera with a massive dome port. These things are really heavy in the water, um, not so much in weight, but in drag. So when you're pushing it through the water, it feels like you're pushing sandbags. And so I knew that I wouldn't be able to keep up with the turtle for a really long period of time if I was swimming sort of on its side. The other thing is that when you're swimming that fast and you're gonna turn on your side there, you can't breathe through your snorkel. So it was all about breath hold as well. And so this does complicate things a bit. It means that you have less time to sort of refine the shot. You kind of need to go in with your settings correct in the first place. And so swimming alongside it, I did in, put it into a burst mode. It wasn't 30 frames a second like my camera can do. I think it was something like 10 frames a second. Why I took that high burst rate was actually because the water ripples on the surface vary so quickly. And so one shot might look, you know, there's no reflection at all. And the next shot, there's a full reflection. The next shot, there might be a broken up reflection. In this particular shot, you know, I've got four or five renditions of the turtle in those reflections. And so by using a burst mode, you really improve your chance of getting that perfect moment where you get the reflections. Now, it could have been better. I admit there's a couple of, uh, a couple of bursts that I, I looked at and the turtle was um, you know, perfectly reflected but wasn't really posed the way that I wanted with its fins. Um, what I particularly like about this shot is, you know, I think that there's that kind of almost um, uh, like rainbowy type diffraction or refraction of, of light on its flipper. And to me, that really drags your attention in. So your eyes just get glued straight to that fin um, and then to the head, then to the shell. And it's got really beautiful sort of soft light on it. So um, this one was what I ended up choosing to go with. Now you're probably wondering what settings I chose because obviously before you get to the turtle, you need to have thought about your settings. You don't have time underwater um, whilst you're uh, you know swimming alongside something to, to fiddle with settings. And so for this particular shot, as you can see here, um, this is the final edit, so it's a TIFF file. I did shoot it in just straight um, Sony RAW, which is an ARW file. Um, this was taken at 1 320th of a second, F7.1 and ISO 400, which might seem like a bit of an odd combination because none of those numbers are particularly rounded. You know, normally people would just choose for an F8, you know, um, or, or in a 1 320th is a bit strange as well. Um, the thing was that the turtle's not moving terribly fast, but as I'm pushing the camera through the water, I know that I'm gonna be getting vibrations on the camera. And so what I'm trying to do is make sure that I'm not stabilizing the, um, or they're getting the shutter speed right to freeze the motion of the turtle so much. I mean, that, that's important. But I'm also worried about the way that I'm moving through the water. The water ripples are gonna be moving my camera around because I'm on the surface there. And so to me, 1 3 seemed like a pretty safe place to be with my shutter speed. In terms of the F7.1, I have absolutely no doubt at the time that I chose F8. <laughs> and uh, my ISO is at 400, not by choice, but my ISO was on auto ISO. And so when I'm shooting this kind of an animal, I've got to really think about what my most important settings are. And we've got ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. Now, to me, the shutter speed was really, really important, but I'm also on an f2.8 lens. And what can happen here is that if I shoot at a fast shutter speed, so I chose, say, 1 3 20th of a second, my camera, if I'm in shutter priority mode, is in control of my, eye, uh, my aperture. Blah, 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 confusing myself. And so it would likely open my aperture right up to something like f2.8. And that's gonna create some really soft edges in my frame. It's also gonna blur my background quite a lot, which may not be the end of the world, but I think it does lose a little bit of texture in the photo. And so I was conscious to try and keep that depth of field at a point where I got optimal sharpness through that dome port, which is at about F8. And then I need the camera to be able to adjust the exposure as I'm moving along because the light's changing, I'm changing my position slightly. If the turtle moves up or down in the water column, I want the camera to automatically adjust the exposure. And so I'll pop it into automatic ISO and let the camera take care of it. The joy of cameras these days compared to say like 10 years ago is that auto ISO might sometimes crank you into sort of a higher number. 400's not that high, but you know, if it went up to sort of a thousand or even 2000, these days, on a camera like a Sony A1, I just couldn't care less. There is not enough grain for me to really get worried about it. Go back 10 years when I was shooting on a different camera, um, you know, slightly more, not entry level, but certainly wasn't as professional as an A1 and the technology wasn't there. 
And ISO is a massive problem. And so that's where we might need to be a little bit more lenient with, uh, with our settings and, and trying to lock some more things in to, to make sure that we, uh, we get what we need out of it. So I'm shooting in manual mode, but I'm using automatic ISO. And that gives me a huge amount of flexibility. So you're probably wondering, how did this shot come out before it's been processed? So let's jump in and we're gonna go right back to the start with a raw file. So I know what you're thinking. The shot looks a little bit more gray, not quite as blue and spectacular and shiny. And I can guarantee to you that when you're under the water there, it does actually look a lot more blue than this. The thing is that this is a raw file. And if you've not played with raw files too much before, um, they don't have anything applied to them. This is completely raw data. And in fact, the better your raw file, you'll find often the less contrasty it is because you've captured more dynamic range. What it's done is it's not crushed the blacks, not crushed the high or, or clipped the highlights. It's actually giving you the whole spectrum of information that's in that shot there. Now, importantly, when I photograph shots like this, I do check my histogram in camera before I leave the scene so that I can fix it if needed. But you can see here, here on my histogram that I'm nowhere near the blacks, nowhere near the whites, so I am peachy. Now, the first thing I did with a shot like this, for me, is to go and get that contrast up, get the color right, and get the white balance correct. Those three things are gonna make a massive, massive difference to start with. They're gonna get me excited about the shot again, because I can tell you when you load it on the computer like this, you go, oh, really? <laughs> so I'm gonna go into my develop panel here, and first things first, I'm gonna go and change my Adobe color profile. I'm gonna change it to Adobe Vivid. Now what you'll see here instantly is we get a little bit more color, we get a little bit more contrast and a little bit more kind of clarity coming through the photo. Next thing I'm gonna do is get my whites and my blacks and I'm gonna drag those into position. So I'm gonna pull the whites up a little bit to make sure I get my highlights and I'm gonna pull my blacks down to make sure that my darks truly represent darks because at the moment, they're kind of in that gray spectrum. And already my before and after look spectacularly different. Spectacularly spectacularly different. Anyway, it looks a whole lot better. So from here, I'm gonna pull my overall exposure up, maybe pull my shadows up just a tiny little bit, and now we're gonna address the color problem. So the color issue here for me is that firstly, it's coming out very blue, and I'd like it to be a touch more kind of greeny yellow. Um, I know that sounds a bit odd for the ocean, but I just feel as though that in a print, having this kind of really vibrant blue might not look quite as nice. So I'm gonna pull my white balance ever so slightly across, towards the greens and towards the yellows. And you can see now there's a bit too much green in it, so I'll pull that back to the magenta a bit, a little bit upping of my color temperature, and we're getting this nice kind of warmth coming out from it now. And then last but not least for my color is I'm gonna look at the vibrancy and saturation aspect of things. So vibrancy and saturation are kind of the same thing, but a little bit different. So saturation is gonna affect the overall colorfulness of your photograph, whereas vibrancy is only going to saturate things that were already pretty colorful in the first place. So as an example, if I pull saturation up, you'll notice that everything gets more colorful, kind of looks like unicorn vomit. If I pull vibrancy up though, what you'll notice is that it's affecting the very, very colorful areas of my photo a lot faster and a lot more than what it is the areas that are less saturated. So things like these brighter tones in here are not being quite as affected. So it's a little bit of a combination of both here, a little bit of saturation and a little bit of vibrancy that's gonna give us that kind of optimal kind of feel to it. Now, if we compare the final edit here to here, Hold on. <laughs> of course it's freezing on me now. If we compare the final edit from where we are now to the final edit, which is here, you'll notice that we're pretty well on track. There's a couple of things that are missing. Firstly, what I really wanna do is make our turtle pop out. Make sure that he's the star of the show. And I'm gonna do that with a little tiny bit of exposure and a little bit of clarity and sharpness. So to select the turtle, traditionally we'd have to go and paint over it with Lightroom's new fan dangled masking tools. I can simply hit onto my masking tool over here and I'm gonna hit subject and just hope, 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 hope that yep, it selects the subject. Now Lightroom's pretty bloody good at this. It's not perfect, that's for sure, but for subjects like this that are a little bit more straightforward, it's pretty, pretty great. Saves you a whole lot of time. Now you'll notice that my turtle has lit up purple and that's because I've adjusted my overlay to be purple as an overlay. 
Purple's a color that very rarely appears in my photos and so it's a lot easier to see. Um, by default, I think this is red and I do find that in things like sunset shots or shots where there's a lot of bright colors, sometimes that red gets a bit lost. So I like using that kind of magenta purple color because that's very rarely in my photos in the first place. Anyway, we're now we've painted it, we can take the overlay off anyway. From here, I'm gonna go down into the mask one and good habit here is to rename it. This is something that's also relatively new in Lightroom. And when I say relatively new, I say that because it's been out for like a year, but it's new in the scheme of things. Um, it's a really, really easy habit to forget to do, a um, really easy habit to skip. Um, and it makes no material difference, except when you go back to re-edit a photo, it can be really, really hard sometimes to work out exactly what mask belong to what. So I like to rename them whenever I remember. From here, I'm gonna to go to my exposure and I pull the exposure up ever so slightly. I might also now put a little bit of dehaze into it because the dehaze is actually gonna create that extra bit of clarity. It's also gonna take a little bit of milkiness off the shot that started to come up from the exposure tool there. So just a tiny bit of exposure, tiny bit of dehaze. Now, I don't think it needs too much more, but if you wanted to, you could go in here and do a little bit of sharpening on it. That will bring out some details if you were to do a big print of a photo like this, which I have just there on the wall. Um, but if you're doing this for online, I'm not sure that that extra bit of sharpening is gonna to make too much of a difference. So we have the before, which is where we're at now, and then we have the final shot here. Now you'll notice that there's a couple of things that are going on in this. The first thing is that we've done a lot of backscatter removal. Now, backscatter is this white particle matter that appears in the background of our shots. Um, even when we're not using strobes, we can get particle matter in our photos, and I think it looks terribly messy, especially when blowing up. The thing is, I don't wanna remove that just yet because there are some other ways that I can start to decomplicate that bit of the water, and then I'm gonna remove that particle matter as the very, very last step because it's really time consuming, and sometimes you put a lot of effort into removing backscatter or those particles to realize that, oh, maybe this photo didn't have the potential you thought it did, and so you can waste a huge amount of time. So instead, what I'm gonna do as a start point is I'm actually going to go and get another mask and I'm gonna go and create a radial mask around our turtle. So the radial mask here allows me to click in the center of where I want to select and then draw a nice big circle or an ellipse. And what you'll see here is I'm actually selecting around the turtle at the moment and I wanna select everything but the turtle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to the mask, I'm gonna rename it and call this D scatter or something like that. And I'm actually gonna go and invert it. I can do that by clicking on the little buttons here. I click the invert D scatter, and you'll see now that it selects everything outside of my circle. Now these two circles here, if you haven't played with them before, the inside one is not affected at all. Outside of the outside circle is completely affected. And the transition between being affected and not affected is the distance between the two circles. So the further apart I pull that circle, which I can do down here. The softer that transition between being affected and not affected is. Now you might be wondering why we're doing this radial filter. And the thing is, there's a lot of detail up here that's very, very small detail that just doesn't need to be there. So all this particle matter, not the big chunky ones, but just this kind of like fine, almost like grain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down into my settings, which is being applied to the de-scatter mask, and I'm gonna go and pull down the texture, and I'm gonna pull down the clarity, and I'm actually gonna pull down the sharpness as well, and I'm gonna go and denoise it quite a bit as well. And what this is gonna do is the denoise is gonna take away the tiniest of tiny particles because it might treat, it starts to treat it as noise. The de hey, sorry, the Removing of clarity and removing of texture will also help to, um, to dull off um, that particle matter as well. And then in terms of my other settings here, I might actually go and pop a little bit of exposure onto it as well. Um, and that's just gonna help to mask it a little bit too. So just to give you an idea, if I turn that D scatter off, just watch in the top right corner. So see it's really harsh. And then when I turn that mask on, you'll see it really smooths things out quite a bit. You could also use the contrast tool to pull the contrast down. And that way, um, this is also gonna help to remove any contrast between those little bit of particle matter that's gonna sit there. Now, I know there are better ways to do this in Photoshop. People use all sorts of different like high pass masking or high pass filter masking and stuff like that. I don't know, 
I've done it before. It sometimes looks really good, sometimes it doesn't. I find this is a very fast way to get pretty good results. And as far as I'm concerned, pretty good results are good enough for me. So I'm at the point now where if I compare those two images that we have, yes, the color is ever so slightly different um, between the two of them, but we're close enough. At the end of the day, we're trying to show the process here, not exactly replicate it. And when I do these edits, they're never something I can perfectly replicate. <laughs> so um, what you'll notice now is we've just got those big chunks of backscatter left. And there's a couple of things we can do here to get rid of those. So if I go into my develop tool, I can obviously use tools like the um, spot removal tool. Um, you've got a couple of different modes that have happened um, recently, when again, recently is like the last 12 months. Um, we've got the content aware remove, we've got the heal tool, and we've also got the clone tool. To be honest, with these sorts of backscatter particles, I would probably just use the heal tool. Um, the heal tool is gonna do a pretty great job of removing them, but I will tell you what, it is slow like really, really painfully slow. And so whenever I'm doing these kind of edits, especially when it's an underwater shot and needs a lot of work in that backscatter department, I tend to leave that to Photoshop because it is a ton faster. So I'm gonna take you through how to do that now. I'm gonna right click on the image. and we're gonna say edit in Photoshop 2023. It's gonna go and open Photoshop 2023. And then we can get into some of the heavy lifting on this shot. All right, so it's really important for me to say that now we're opened up in Photoshop, you do not need to know how to get around Photoshop to use this tool. It's a fantastic tool, but no, you do not need to know all the ins and outs and do Photoshop courses to work it out. This one's really, really basic, and it's pretty much one of the only reasons I use Photoshop. So you'll see you've got a layers panel here. Now, if it's not there, you could always go to window and then make sure it's selected and you'll see it pop up. What we're actually gonna do is create a new layer. Now that's a little plus symbol down the bottom here. It's blank. And we're gonna go across and there's an option here called Spot Healing Tool. It's also the J key if you wanted to have a keyboard shortcut. If you don't know Photoshop very well, don't worry about shortcuts. Just use the button, use your mouse. It's not that hard, you won't be doing it that often. Shortcuts are amazing when they speed up the process because you're doing it lots or you're doing it as a repetitive task. So we're gonna hit that spot removal tool and it'll give you a nice circle. A Couple of things we need to do just to make sure that we're setting this up correctly. Firstly, make sure that sample all layers is selected on top. Now that's gonna mean that when it goes to replace that section, it's actually gonna sample the bottom layer, but what we're gonna be doing is actually putting the spot removal on a separate layer. And that way it's easy to erase later on or undo. If you do the spot removal on the original layer, you can't go back in time and remove them very easily at all. The other thing we're gonna do is go content aware fill. To be honest, I don't think it's gonna make any difference whatsoever with removing backscatter, which one you choose, but content aware seems to do a pretty good job. To change the size of your brush there, you can right click and use the size. We don't want it to be massive, <clears throat> but we do want it to be big enough to cover a whole little dot or a whole backscatter dot. So here we go, I'm gonna go up, mine's gonna be about 100-ish I reckon, yep. And what I'm gonna do is just simply paint over the dots. Now you can zoom in and do this. What I'd be really careful not to do though is get pedantic about going and spot removing every single tiny little piece of dot that you see. Because inevitably there'll be some left over and it's gonna look really strange to have a couple of really prominent ones as odd ones out. So I would go through this not super rough, but I definitely wouldn't be going through and trying to remove every single dot that I saw really gonna just be trying to remove the most prominent dots in here. Now, some of this is actually water surface, which I still think looks messy, so I'm gonna remove it. But this process, I could sit here, it's like whack-a-mole. Every time you, you get rid of one, another one seems to crop up. But I can spend a long time doing this. I'm not gonna bore you with it now, but we'd go through and we'd remove all of those extra dots. And even this stuff here, they're not Backscatter, this is just particle matter on the surface, but it still looks messy. So, there we go. Any other large dots down here as well I might remove. Don't want to remove fish. But there's certainly you know, a couple of random kind of particles that do really stand out, so we'll remove those. Now, the cool thing is, as I said, because we're doing this on a separate layer, we're not doing this on the same layer as our turtle. 
What you'll be able to see, if I turn the actual image off underneath, is you can see all the dots where I've replaced it or whether I've, where I've used the heel tool. And so if you wanted to go back and say, for instance, this didn't do a very good job, let's just, I don't know, say that we wanted to keep that bit of water there, I can actually go and find my eraser inside my tools here, which gosh knows where they are because there's too many tools in here, but it's in there somewhere, there it is, eraser. And I could actually go and erase that spot removal and when I turn my base layer back on again, you notice that those spots are back. So we're actually applying the layer correction um, or the, the applying the correction to, to a separate layer and that to me is really, really helpful. Um, I've found in the past, I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble um, spot removing on the original image and then finding that, uh oh, there's some that I wanted to keep or some that I thought needed to be undone and it's, it's hard to go back. So if I turn this layer on and off, you can see the main spots are removed this is a good way to gauge which ones are still distracting. Get rid of those ones and that one. And there we have it. A whole bunch of spot removal done. Now, to get this back into Lightroom once you've mucked around with it enough and you're happy to go, we simply hit the cross in the corner and we hit save. And what it's gonna do is pull it back into Lightroom as a .psd or a .tiff file, depending on how you've configured your Lightroom setup. And it's gonna have all of those changes reflected. It is important to remember when we do this, as much as you go, there's my PSD file. Um, if I open this now in Lightroom, you'll see that all of my sliders have reset. And that's because when it goes out to Lightroom or out to Photoshop to, uh, to get these edits done, it flattens all of our edits and creates a new file. So it compresses it all together and says, cool, that's done, that's a single file. And now um, it's, it's uh, flattened all of our edits. So it can't go back from there. This is why I always do my backscatter as an absolutely last step. Worst case scenario, you can always go back to your original raw file that has all the edits and go back into Photoshop and you can redo all those spot removals if there are adjustments that need to be made. But I tell you what, that can be super frustrating and very, very time consuming. So team, there you have it. We've gone from what was a very, very gray looking raw file all the way through to a nice vibrant shot of our turtle on the Ningaloo Reef. Now, I'm a new channel, please be sure to like the photo, like the video, subscribe if you wanna see more of this stuff because I tell you what, I so enjoy bringing you behind the scenes on my shots, talking to you about the stories, how I created them, showing you through the edits and hopefully, hopefully inspiring you to get out there, take more shots and edit some of your own photos as well. Thanks guys, we'll see you next time.